You're now tuning in to the First in 10 podcast, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Justin Tuggle of the Edmonton Eskimos. Very, very uh, you know, excited to have you on the podcast. Uh, first quarterback, then, of course, outside linebacker, inside linebacker, and, of course, now about to be, I believe, one of the better linebackers and defensive players in the league right now. So really, really glad to have you on, man. I just want to – really excited for this. So thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it, man. Hey, man, I appreciate the invite, and uh, I love to talk to you today, man. Uh, absolutely. So I'm going I'm to break down. I just want to know about your football journey. All right. So I know, I know you come from a bloodline of uh, football players. Of course, you have your brother, Grady Jarrett, with the Atlanta Falcons right now. Your dad, Jesse, Jesse Tingle, uh, Tuggle, sorry, uh, to playing with the Atlanta Falcons in the ring of honor and whatnot. Uh, but just want to go down to how it all started. All right. So for you, uh, how old was it? Was it something that you just thrust into like, coming from Alfreda, Georgia? Like, how, where did that love for football start uh, all together? In the, in the, I the think the, the love really started just watching my dad. Right. I remember my earliest memories of being in the locker room for the Falcons games, being at practice, watching him come home, watch film. And it's just always something I wanted to do. I just, I just couldn't wait to play football. I played baseball and basketball before football. I, saw, I started every sport early, but I think I started playing football when I was five or six years old. Ooh, okay. okay. So when I, once I first got started, I just said, like, man, I just can't wait. And I remember, like, going out there the first day of practice and just how that feeling felt. And it still feels like that for me today, which is amazing. So yeah. I just appreciate so much of everything that's going on because it's like, here I am, what's that, 25 years later, and I'm right. still playing the game. So it's amazing. That's, that's amazing, man. And I, I, I remember seeing – I'm going to get to that very soon. I'm going to get to, I want to, I want to kind of just go through the journey. Of course, of course it started with your father, uh, but he started you. I don't know if it was you or your father started you at quarterback, right? Yeah. So you're a professional player and defensive player right now, but starting at quarterback, once again, I was a quarterback at high school, played in university as well. Um, but and it's an, I love the offensive side of the ball, but I can never imagine myself transitioning to the defensive side of the ball. Right. I can probably be a DB because I, I had some speed, but, like, how was that transition for you going to Duluth, uh, Northview uh, Secondary School in, in Georgia? Um, you know, passing for as many yards as you did, running for as many yards as you did, passing for over 3,500 yards. Um, you know, of course, 44 touchdowns in your career at, at Duluth uh, right there. How did that – you know, like just, do you ever foresee yourself becoming a defensive player at any point in your career? Never. <clears throat> it's funny because, like, growing up, I always wanted to touch the ball. I wanted to be on offense. I wanted to score touchdowns. My dad played linebacker for 14 years for the Falcons. So it's like everyone expected me to play defense. I never wanted to play defense. I think that was sort of thing. I, I didn't want people to put me in the same boat as my dad. I didn't want to be, oh, you're, you're only doing this because you're dad or you only, you're getting this because of him. I want to make my own name. <clears throat> so growing up, I was mostly a running back until I switched to quarterback in middle school. And then from middle school on, it was, that's, what, that's what it was. And I remember even when college coaches would come recruit me when I was in high school, I would always tell them, like, I'm not playing no other position. So if you come to offer me, I don't, there's nothing that I can do for you. Mm -hmm. Notre Dame offered me to play safety. Georgia Tech offered me to play safety. But I just told the coach, thank you, but no thanks, because I wasn't interested in playing defense. I, mean, I wasn't interested in playing defense at all. I just wanted to play offense. I wanted to play quarterback. Mm -hmm. even, even in high school, I wasn't even trying to run the ball that much because I wanted to show people I was a pocket passer. I wanted to be back there really throwing the ball, dropping back, and just letting it go because it's, it's already tough being a black quarterback. That's and then, worse. And then when you get that stereotype or you want to run the ball, it's like they, now they don't, no one believes you can throw the ball. But I always wanted to show people I could throw the ball and I could go out there and play at a high level. And so that's what I did. And that's how I prepared myself. That's how I trained just days and days and weeks and months. And that turned into years into going to Boston College. So it was, it was a great ride for me. Yeah, of course. And you started as a redshirt freshman, a right. few games, four games, of course, with, uh, with Boston College as a redshirt freshman. Um, so, so about that decision to go to Boston College, of course, um, getting to, before I even get to that, because I have so many questions to ask you, but team takeover, when did this start? Like, when did that mentality, is with the mentality, when did this start all together, uh, you know, the driving force behind that? All right, team takeover started around 2014, 2015. It didn't get official till 2016. But it's something that I always felt like if I touch it, I want to take over in that spot. Right. My, 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 my Twitter handle, my Instagram handle was always take over Tuggle. And I always felt like if I'm in the mix, I'm going to take it over. So, and it sort of just led on to that. I feel like more people can have that same mindset. And you can apply that mindset to so many different things in life. Mm -hmm. It was always a great thing. Like, I felt like I wanted to capitalize on. So that's how Team Taylor came about. And then first I started getting stuff printed on shirts. And they started picking up, started changing designs. This is a Team Takeover shirt right here. I started with the hats, 
that was the first thing I started to do to sell. And then from there, it just kept going on and on. And I have a lot of stuff, I had a lot of stuff coming this year that I've already put out and I have even more stuff coming as long as well. So it's been good. It's been good. I've, it's been something I've been growing slowly. And I see people picking up to it and gravitating towards it. So hopefully it keeps on building momentum. Oh, I totally get it. And of course, I've been on your site going through the hoodies, the, the shorts, okay. everything. It's pretty crazy so far. Okay. Um, but just now, now just because I'm transitioning, I've always seen all these questions and I'll get to uh, some stuff really soon. But transitioning from Boston College, right? You went to high school, you, you know, were successful in high school at the quarterback position, going to Boston College, playing there, and then deciding, uh, you know, going to Blinn, uh, Blinn College, of course, in uh, Bremen, Texas, I believe. Bremen, Texas. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, playing there and you know, just killing it all together, right? Being the most successful quarterback in, in that league, just throwing just for, like, so everything you did at that, at, at that level right there. You threw for 2,000 uh, yards, 70 touchdowns, and you rushed for 12 scores and 733 yards. So you really balled out there. Going to, going to Blinn College was your entire mentality just like, okay, I'm going to come here and just get out, get out Juco and get back into, you know, the Big 12, one of the big conferences? Like, what was the mentality? Exactly. <clears throat> so when I left Boston College, I was so I had to make a decision what I wanted to do. Do I want to transfer to another Division One school and sit out a year? Or do I want to go – then I figure out that I can go to a junior college and actually play that year and not miss a season. So I feel like that was the best route. I wanted to get better. So I said, like, let me go to a junior college, get on the field and play. And luckily, I knew Cam. I knew Cam Newton. Mm-hmm. But before he got the blend, like when we were in high school, we had all going through all the quarterback circuits and camps. Right. I mean, I can't do that. So then when I was looking at schools, I saw what he was doing down at Blend. He was having a great year down there. So I ended up taking a visit down to Blend. I met him. I met another guy named Sean Rutherford. Mm-hmm. And it's just like I cl- we clicked instantly. And it was just like, this is the place I want to be. So I ended, and I, ended, I decided to end up going down there for a year. Mm-hmm. But the, from the time I stepped on campus, I knew that I came down here to play football and I came down here to get back to a major D1. and. I had my sights on that, and that's what happened. I ended up being the number one junior college uh, quarterback in the country that year. Mm-hmm. Had a lot of offers, ended up, side, ended, up, ended up deciding to go to Kansas State early. I committed in, like, September of that year. So I knew where I wanted to go early, and I, th- I knew that when I, I, I spoke to Coach Schneider at Kansas State that I was going to get the opportunity to go out there and play quarterback and just take my career to the next level and then hopefully get to the NFL as a quarterback because I knew I had the skill level. I just needed the opportunity. Right, definitely. And you said, you said Sean Rutherford, and I see Sean Rutherford – you know, uh, doing a lot of stuff with different quarterbacks and, of yeah. course, you know, training and whatnot. Uh, did, 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 talk about his influence on you, too, uh, you Man. know, of course, playing the quarterback position. Okay, so when I get the, <clears throat> when I get the blend, it's so crazy because Sean was at blend before Cam came. Right. He was supposed to be the quarterback that he had registered a year, that he was supposed to be the quarterback the year Cam came. That's crazy. Okay. Then, That's- then I come the next fo- – the following year. Oh, okay. And so you think guy in that position, he's going to get frustrated. He's going to say – now, I, I, got, I got an issue with both these guys, whatever. But it, it was the complete opposite. That's, that's my guy right there. That's one of my best friends. Right. He took his role as a receiver, and he ran with it. He turned that into a, a great career. He actually ended up going to Texas State and playing quarterback at Texas State. So that's type, to show you the type of guy, athlete he is, the type of guy he is as well. Right. And now he's just mentoring kids and training, training quarterbacks. And I think in the next few years, he's going to be mentioned with the top, the top guys out there in California and Texas and – other states like that and he's gonna have once these guys keep growing up these high school kids he's mentoring right now they're gonna be NFL quarterbacks and I think that's when his name is gonna hit a national a national stage and that's how he prepares himself to do it right now for sure because he's, he's working with some of the best recruits right now so of course he's sure. gonna get up there and I think perseverance and obviously trusting guy can get you a, a really further places of course uh but exactly. now speaking of you know you going to Kansas State and I just even if you have so many things to talk about because I think your journey is just amazing but now, you know, through this entire process, you have your dad in your corner. You have, um, you know, it, it, when I say the name Chuck Smith, is Chuck Smith another guy that helps you out? Like, there's so many different sure. people that kind of help you out, right? But now you go into Kansas State. Uh, in your junior year, did you decide, did you decide to switch? You, know, you, wanted, you went there trying to be, you know, wanted to be a quarterback, but did you switch in your junior year to you know, say, okay, you know what, I'm going to make the, the transition? Because I, 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 I remember watching you in games when you are playing Landry Jones and, of course, against Oklahoma. I, know, I remember watching you against Texas, of course, McCoy, and all those plays you made. But my, 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 like, the question I have, because I'm like, huge in college football, huge in these things, but when did you decide? Was it your junior year, of course, or was it more the senior year? All right, so it was, it was the end of my junior year. Okay, there you go. So I came in to Kansas State. I had two more years of eligibility. So I came in the, the, the fall of my – I mean, the winter of my junior year. So I came in right before spring practice. When I got there, I was told that I was going to be 
ready in the in the spot to compete for the starting job. Colin Klein gets hot early in the season, and he has a Heisman type year. So, so now I I don't play a snap my junior year. I'm sitting on the sideline. I'm I'm backing up at quarterback, and I'm thinking like, I left Boston College. I went to Blinn. I was number one quarterback. I came to K State, and now I'm not getting a chance to even play. So it's so crazy to me. Like a lot of thoughts are going through my mind. What do I do? Do I transfer again? and try to go somewhere else for my fifth year? Do I do something else like that? So I just kept thinking, thinking, thinking. I didn't want to leave again. I, I, I love where I was at and the team I was with. And um, the best thing, me and my dad, we always had this, like, this running joke. He would always tell me, like, man, I, I believe I can – I believe you can play linebacker if I work with you. Like, and we would laugh about it all the time. We would look at different teams. I mean, I know you can play for this team. I know you can play for that team. It was always just a joke. Right. Until the end of my junior year came, so then we get we get accepted to go to the uh, Fiesta, no, the Cotton Bowl, my junior year. Mm-hmm. So we we're about to do we we're about to do all the bowl practices and the bowl prep. Right. And I tell the coaches like, all right, I'm ready to switch mm-hmm. positions. And then the linebacker coach at the time, Coach Kosh, he was the defensive coordinator, linebacker coach. <clears throat> he had been he had been taking a liking to me. We had been talking, talking. He said, let's do it. So the first day I said switch, they threw me into the nine on seven drill. And I still had my quarterback jersey on, a green jersey, <laughs> quarterback pass. Yeah. I didn't know what to do. He was like, go get the ball. Jeez. And then from that point on, I was just rolling. So we, we hit the ground rolling. Right. And so after that bowl prep was over with, I went home, talked to my dad, and we just hit the – we just watched the film every day for like a month and a half, the whole winter break. Mm-hmm. We watched film every single day. I come back into K-State my senior year, the, 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 the winter heading into my senior year, mm-hmm. right before spring practice, and then I'm officially a linebacker. Right. And then from that point on, ended up going to start that year. And it was a great year for me. I made a lot of big plays. And I made it to the league as an undrafted free agent. So it, it was the craziest journey. Like I said, people, people here are like, I can't believe you play quarterback. But my style of quarterback, I feel like I was always a physical quarterback. Of course. Like I, said, I like to be a pocket passer. But when I ran the ball, I ran the ball mm-hmm. with, with power. I ran the ball with finesse. And I knew how to play. So the transition over was really smooth. And people think, like, man, how could you do that? But really, it's just playing – Offense on the defense side of the ball. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the quarterback of the defense at linebacker. Literally, literally. And so I see, I see everything in reverse now. So I can see different sets. I can identify different players. I can identify and see what's going on. And from that point, I just go and make the play. And that's exactly what I was just about to ask you. Like, yeah. how was the, the transition of you being a, like starting as like an edge rusher, outside linebacker? You played outside and inside with Houston as well too, which I'll get into really soon. But did you just find that it was an easy transition because you can identify as a quarterback? Okay, this is I, I know of course in this blitz. You know, I, this is what this outside lineman is supposed to do. I know in this coverage. So with everything just you just you're just a football player. So you just it's exactly. it easy for you to kind of get that all together, right? I just <clears throat> once I understood the concept and see how the defense was really the the scheme, how they taught it on that side compared to how we were learning to beat it on the offensive side, mm-hmm. it was a smooth transition. And then it just, from there, it was just line up, be athletic, and make a play. So it's, it's so so different. Defense is so different. Off, offense, you have to wait for your play to be called. That's why a quarterback, I love having a ball in my hands because I was controlling the game. Mm-hmm. But on defense, you have to go out – you just go out there and react. So, yeah. uh, you play receiver, you may be the best receiver ever, but you can't get the ball and no one's going to see it. But on defense, you make your own plays. And I really love that aspect as well. So, mm-hmm. when I lined up out there, I knew if I could – if I beat my man on defense, whoever's trying to block me, I'm to the ball and I'm free from that point. So, let's, let's go get it. So Wow. I mean, yeah, that's, that's a crazy – and I think a lot of credit has to go to your dad, but you're the one that actually did it, so that, that's amazing yeah, uh, from your perspective. But uh, now, now thinking just you playing in the Big 12 at Kansas State, you're going to school. Kansas State, obviously, is a crazy fan base, of course. Right. How was that experience going to, like, a, you know, a big, a big 12 conference team and having, you know, Coach Snyder, have all those guys – you know everything you see on TV, and like now, now you're actually you're, you're in it. And you no, know, I know you had you had experience with, with BC and Boston College, but right. I think the Big Twelve is just a different different animal. Sometimes. It's different, you know. It's different. BC was cool. I, I enjoyed BC, and that's a, definitely a D one experience. Right. And then like going there and playing all the other all the other schools, you know, Boston College Stadium is not the biggest stadium, but you're playing at Florida State, you're playing at Clemson, right. you're right. playing at all these other schools like that, and it's like wow, you, I, these are schools I grew up playing with on the video game. Now I'm actually playing at the stadium. 100%. I think when I went to junior college, you go, you get out in these stands, and it's like 100 people at the game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Junior college is really like for the love of the game. Like, of everyone out there has a dream just to make it to a bigger mm-hmm. level. So that made me appreciate it so much more. So when I get to Kansas State, we're I'm playing in front of 60,000, 70,000, 100,000 100, at Texas. So it's like, okay, I'm back. Like, I'm here. This, this is exactly where I want it to be. And then now when I switch positions, it's like, who would have thought that I'd be starting at another position that I've never really played? I played defense maybe 
three snaps all of high school. So it's like I, never played, <laughs> yeah. I was I was specializing on offense. So now I'm starting at a position I've never played. I've never even thought about really my senior year. And now everything's on the line. This is a one year. I got one year to make it. There's no redos, no anything else. But I just enjoyed the process so much, man. I had so much fun out there. And one thing about Kansas State is we worked hard. Like mm-hmm. we had a lot of success the two years I was there. But we worked and we earned everything that we got because Coach Nada didn't take a day off with us, and we really put in that work and we grinded out. And I think that made a lot of us close, made a lot of close friendships through that bond, just grinding like that, and things that last forever. That's amazing, man. And, and I want to go to a quote too because it kind of just sums up what you just, you know, illustrated and actually went through. Mm-hmm. I ain't looking for no handouts. I'm a standout. Sometimes I freestyle, <laughs> like it's planned out. Never gave me a chance. I just had to stay down. Now look how it panned out. My mom, the man now. Life on beats, all right. So what you have right now, you know, with with uh, Plumber, all right, what you're, what you're yep. doing with all this music. Have you always been, you know, into just music and freestyling? Has that been a passion for a long time as well? Always love music. I spent hours on LimeWire. I used to I used to crash the computer. I used to be downloading the torrents, trying to get albums before they came out. This is before streaming. Like I always had all the music. Uh, people even like in college, I I may I would people would bring their iPods or whatever mp3 player they had to my house and I would load it up for them. That, that, that was always me. Yeah. So it was always, so when things opened up and I had the chance, I always wanted to rap, I always would freestyle, I always would make songs on my computer. But not, even before I had a microphone, I would record on the computer mic, like through the, through the, uh, through the camera mic. So yeah. it's like I had to figure out how to do it. Then once I figured, run, figured out how to do it and play with it, play with it some more, I kept getting a little bit better, a little bit better. We started, started messing around with it a little more. And then I met, um, I met TP when I was mm-hmm. in Toronto. Mm-hmm. He had the same passion. That dude right there knows every, he knows so much about rap. And we, so we would go there and we would just listen to my song. Like, man, let's just put a tape out. Let's just do it. Okay. So actually the first year, first year I got to Toronto 2017, mm-hmm. me and him, we're just freestyle. We, we had like a couple like freestyle tapes we put out. One called Days in the Six. We did. So that was cool. We never put that one out though. Like we, we just had that for ourselves. Mm-hmm. The following year, 2018, we're like, man, let's do it for real. So we put it, we got in there. We were living together. We ended up putting a tape together called Life on Beats. And that's exactly what the way it was just life on beats. We were just talking about what's going on and then just trying to keep it as real as we could. And um, I think it turned out well. And that just gave us the confidence and the momentum to keep going. And from life on beats came calculated chances. And then from there, it's a lot more, it's a lot more cooked up right now that we haven't put out there. So, so it's just trying to figure out how to, how to release it really. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely listened to some, and even like some other players too, like Shaq Johnson, he has his own tape out. There's a lot yeah. of people, players got stuff out, but time to get paid is probably my, my favorite on that. Right. Album. Of course, where the cash at. I, yeah, that, that one's fire, and I think Knack Knack was on one called Life. Yeah, Knack, Knack was talking on one. Yeah, yeah, that he was really he was yeah, going yeah. In one, he was going in on that one for sure. So of course, for everyone that you know, listens to Life on Beats, it's Spotify, Apple Music, everywhere, right? But now yeah. going transitioning now for you, you know, so actually you've been in Houston, okay? I wanted to ask this, and as an undrafted free agent, you know, grinding, getting that job, or actually, you know, signing with the Texans, uh, right. of course, playing there um, under, you know. Mike Vrabel, your defensive coordinator, of course. Mm-hmm. What did you learn from that experience? Like, I, I, I remember watching you intercept. First of all, how was the feeling of you intercepting Andrew Luck? Like, I, I remember watching that. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, like I said, that's somebody you see who's a top name, but and so he get he has a lot of respect around. Him. And he, when I got in the league, he had been in the league probably. I think he's. A, I think he came in the league maybe one or two years before me, and maybe, maybe 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 three. So. He was already established, and then that was my first year starting. And the ball, and it just happened. The play just happened right there, and I had like I had been on had a nice little streak that game, mm-hmm. so I, I was on fire, and I caught that one, and then that just sort of changed the pace of the game up a little bit. So it was yeah. a great play. It's a great play, and, and just playing playing in Houston now. Of course, you're there for three seasons. Um, you know, under O'Brien, just under that entire franchise itself, right? Uh, you're playing with Jadavion Clowney, you know, guys like JJ, all those guys. Um, but Mike Vrabel, like. How is his coach? Like, are you surprised by any of the success he has right now? Or you just, you just, it, was he one? Like, what do you learn from him? What do you take away from him being the linebacker as well, of course, playing under him? Right. No, you know, that's a guy who's really hands on. And um, everything he's doing now as a head coach, those things he was doing when he was just a position coach, my first, my, 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 my two years with him in Houston. Right. So he, he came my second year into Houston. So my first year, we had a different, we were under uh, Coach Kubiak staff. And then Kubiak. Coach O'Brien came my second and third year. So, when I was with Vrabel those, those those last two years, he taught us a lot. He taught us a lot from him, his experience, and just the just the mentality he has. He has a dog mentality in him. And he 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 doesn't he he wants to be the alpha in the room. And he wants to take over, and he wants to show you that 
that he's tough and he wants you to be tough with him. So that, 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 that type of mentality is how do I see how I see how the Tennessee Titans are playing. They play with a chip on their shoulder. And that's something that we carried in the room. And we had a lot of dogs in the room as well. So it was great being under seeing someone like that and the playing underneath them. You see how them have so much success with the Patriots and with all the, all the rings they end up winning. We're hearing stories about that. So it was a good experience. 100%. And you even said, I remember uh, looking at a, an interview you did, um, is Chuck Smith, your dad, Chuck Smith, uh, you, mm-hmm. like, are you, are you, were you training a lot with him back then? Or you, was he, has he been a, a positive influence in your life as well? Oh, for too? sure. Was, yeah. So I met, I've known Chuck since I was a little kid. So I, I watched him play with my dad all the years. And when I ended up switching to um, linebacker at Kansas State, they had me rushing off the edge. Right. So my dad had me, so I got back in contact with Chuck. My dad's real co- close friends with him. And so I would just go and work out with him and just work on all the hand, all the hand fighting, all the techniques, how to rush and get better at that. And so from that was probably 2012. And even today, we still communicate, we still talk, and I still go work out with him all when I get a chance. So, so he, the, business, the things that he does, he's so just meticulous on technique and really just when to throw your hands, when to move your hips, when to do this, when to do that. He's done it. He's a, he's a top-end pro, you know what I'm saying? He's a, that's an all-pro player. He knows exactly how to play, one of the best rushers in NFL history. So it's great to see guys like that get their shine. And I think he's getting a lot of shine now because – if you look around the NFL, every top pass rusher almost had – he's almost had their hands on at some point, even for a little bit of time. And I think that his, his, his work speaks for itself in that aspect. 100%, man. That's awesome. And now, like, once again, you have all that time. You know, you, 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 your, your journey was just, like, really, really you – know, it, it was a real journey, of course, getting right. to that point. But now, you know, of course, with Cleveland for a bit, but then signing with Toronto and actually moving out of, you know, the, the States to come to Toronto – Right. Here, of course, in the sense of with us um, in this in the city, how was that transition for you mentally? Just being like, okay, you know, I'm gonna go see. Like, do you like who are, do you have any connections down here that helped you get you know you know transition a little bit to get acclimated with the city? Uh, and being no, not, it was completely news for me. I didn't know anybody. I knew people playing in the in the CFL. I knew uh, Devere Posey. We had played together in Houston. There we go. Yeah. Um, that was, so that was a good connect. And then I knew a couple other guys, but for the most part, I didn't know anything about the game really until I decided I was going to head up there. And once I decided to sign with Toronto, from that point, I uh, started watching a lot of games. Mm-hmm. I watched mm-hmm. a lot of games and figure out what's going on. But watching as a fan, sometimes you don't really understand the little yeah, the nuances. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You don't you don't know what's really going on. So I watched the games. I was really on YouTube. I was on YouTube watching games, watching games, and I was like. I, I can play. It really is football. At the end of the day, it's football. I know there's a different rule set, bigger field, extra person, the little, the yard off the ball. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I saw it was football. So I know I could play football, and I feel like it's a great opportunity for me. So I ended up going to Toronto, and I'm glad I made the decision. 100%. And you even said, too, one of the ways like during the quarantine, uh, one of the ways to see if I can actually raise the popularity or anything in this country. Like, I do feel, like, once again, like, I've been going to CFL games my entire life because we have a football right. family. That's all family. But there are a majority in, in, in this country that are not exposed to that, right? So you said right. you probably have, like, a CFL, like, video game, you know, like something to, to, to drive it. I'm like, I'm totally behind your idea there. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I think I think that the CFL needs to do a better job of marketing. Right. You got world-class athletes, but you're treating them like they're almost like they're second rate, and that's making other people believe they're second rate. But really, we're top in athletes. We play the game just as well as anyone else plays. But the biggest difference between the NFL and the CFL is the rule set. The gameplay, right. the gameplay is just different because it's a different game. If you're looking for the NFL, you got to watch uh, American football. Like the CFL, what they, the special power they have is the CFL. Like you have a hundred fifty year history, like right? older than any other professional sports league. That speaks for itself, right there. But it doesn't get broadcast enough. You have Hall of Fame players who played in the CFL and went to the NFL and were Hall of Famers. Mm-hmm. I think those guys have to be celebrated more. Because it's so much history there. These new leagues pop up, the XFLs, the AAFs. That's cool and everything, but there's no history behind it. So how can you have a fan base? The CFL fan base is already implemented right there in the country of Canada. You have your own setup, your own stadiums. There's a lot that can be done. I think, I think the league can grow. And I hope that the people who are in charge are paying attention right now to the landscape because this is the perfect time. We didn't play this season because of uh, COVID. But it's a great time to take this year to think and to grow into bigger – bigger and better things if they need some help they can always call me because i got and, i was just about to say like you should just be the marketing manager yeah. for this league man like come on randy bros you gotta gotta get on this but now no you, you coming to toronto um you have guys like uh sean lemon you know um just it, it's a wilder 
uh, some other guys laying and whatnot. Mm -hmm. When you came to Toronto, was it like, how, like how was it? You transitioned pretty well, but playing with that team, you guys are a really close group. Like how winning the Super Bowl, sorry, Super Bowl, Super Bowl winning a great yeah, cup yeah. as well here uh, in that snowball. Like how was that experience that year, those few years with the Toronto Argos? Man, it was, it was a lot of ups and downs, right. but we won when it counted. And that, and that, that pushed you in history forever. Because you, if you're looking back at that, at that season, we were so far under 500. Mm. No, no one would have picked us to win a, win a great cup. Right. But how things play out, you got to play the game. And that's, that's, that's the amazing thing about the CFL because you never know. You're never out of the game. You're, not, you're never out of any game, and you're never too far ahead of any game to really relax. And that's, and that's how the season goes as well because around Robin's schedule, you play the same team so often, you never know how it's going to end up. We were so cold at the beginning of the year in 2017. Mm -hmm. Ricky Ray gets hurt. Right. And it's like everything is going downhill until we catch that momentum in the middle of the year, and then we ride that all the way into the Grey Cup. And it's like you look back, it's like we were 9-9 nine and nine going into the playoffs, and we ended up winning the ring. So you couldn't draw it up no other way. No one, if you told someone at the beginning of the year they're going to win, no, I think no one think anyone would have believed us. But the guys in the room believed. Coach Tressman helped us believe. We stayed in there tight together. We worked hard every single day, and we made it happen. 100%. I was there for that Eastern Conference final against uh, Saskatchewan. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that, was, that was a good game. Yeah, yeah that was a great game. It was, was cool, cool, too, because BMO was packed. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that goes back to marketing. Like, if you sell it the right way, people will come out and watch you play. So I, it just has to be sold the right way. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was definitely one of the best experiences I've had as, a, as an article, uh, you know, supporter for my entire life, to be honest. With you. But what I was going to ask you, too, is during quarantine, we mentioned COVID, we mentioned uh, what's going on. I've asked this to all the players I've interviewed, but uh, how have you stayed focused? Have you stayed sharp throughout this time? What have you, uh, what, 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 what qualities have you, you know, developed throughout this time? And being with family, being with your, your child, like how, how has that been? Are you in Georgia right now? Or are you actually in it? Oh no, I'm a, I'm not in Canada right now, but um, but it's just it's good to be home. Like I'm 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 at home. I'm with my family. You know what I'm saying it's, it's the longest period. I, I, this is the longest time I've been home since my son was born. So it's, it's been it's been great. You know what I'm saying it's it just it's people realize people don't really realize how long you're gone throughout the CFL season. It's six and a half, seven months you're gone. And then the other bit of time you you heal up, you train, and you head back up to Canada to play. So really, this year has been a good year for me in that aspect. I got to spend a lot of time around the house. I got to work on some other projects, like I said, with the team takeover projects, Great. with the uh, top floor visions, the music. It's just, it's, it's a lot of stuff that's been going on in those things. And I, really, I've been taking a lot of time to learn just little, little things that I, I wouldn't have the time to do any other time. Like, it's so funny because you get so busy in life that you don't really get, you don't, when things slow down, it's like, wow. I didn't know that all this was going on until I really paid attention to it now. And I think that's what this year has been like for everyone. It's been like a year of reflection, good and bad. It's been a lot of bad things that have happened this year, but I hope that people have found good things to hold on to to keep them strong through all these like trying times because it seems like every day is something new. Trust but that's really how it, it's, been, it's been a crazy year, but I've been trying to make the most out of it. I've been trying to stay on my routine as much as possible. I've been working out throughout the whole year, I'm still been staying in shape. Like I said, I've been recording a lot of music. I've been reading a lot. I've been trying to watch a lot of like how-to videos and to do the craziest stuff, really. But it's like, man, I have no, I have nothing else on my slate. So it's, it's cool just to just kick back for a little bit and try to do some different things. A hundred percent. And I was going to speak about. Um, I, I was not meaning to ask you too, but you now going to Hamilton, Hamilton being there for you know having the chance to be in the the last Great Cup too, but. Um, Delvin Bro Senior, like how, how, like that, that person right there, of course, knowing his story, right. knowing, you know, know, what he's went through, how has he, has he been kind of like a, a big brother to you in the past? I've always been asking you. You know, um, <clears throat> I would say big brother, but like we see eye to eye and we are like just like supreme peers because mm -hmm. me and me and Bro, our lockers right beside each other uh, last year. That was my first time meeting him personally. I, I played, I've seen him play against us when I was in Toronto. I never had spoke with him, never had, had any, any uh, dealings with him. So last year it was really great just to get a chance to just pick his brain and listen to him. And, and then even like the last couple months, I knew some of his story about his neck and how he had broke it in high school and came back. That right there is amazing by itself. Like to have an injury like that and to come back and be so dominant. Mm -hmm. And then you play on one level. And I think he came up from like a semi-pro league and worked his way to the CFL and to the NFL. Now he's still a top DB in the CFL. So it's like, that story by itself is amazing. Yeah. And then for the last couple of months, I'm seeing him, him putting his personal story out there. And I'm like, 
dude, I didn't even know any of this stuff was going on with you or before in your life. And I, I'm sitting here with you every single day. So I know it probably feels like a great load off your shoulders to get that out there, to speak with people and just to, just to tell people what's been going on with his life because truly it's amazing. Like he's overcome so much and to be in the position he is, I think that's really inspiring for a lot of people. And I think people need that type of inspiration in their life. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And even going back to this year and just this entire quarantine period, like this, this year has really been like a catalyst for growth. Like, right. like a lot of thin people, we got reflecting, just, just sharpening yourself as a person. Right. right. But um, now, you know, of course your time in Hamilton, you know, being at the ultimate high of having a great cup and then of course having the, the, the loss, even though you guys beat them twice during the year, like that's, that's balanced. But I, I do feel that you right now is in the linebacker in, in, in this league are definitely, I think, like, definitely one of the top ones in the league right now. Should deserve more recognition. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why they're playing with you. I don't know why they're playing right. with you. But um, now we're going to ask the, the Edmonton Eskimos. Um, have you gone out there yet? Have you have you have you seen it? Right? Have they always? I been did. Right? I was um. I went out there like right right before everything got bad, and we had like a little uh like a media run. We just we took a lot of pictures. Of course, it never came out because everything happened. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, but it was cool though. I got to see the city for a little bit, a little bit more than I usually I usually do. Uh, I got to meet the meet the staff. I, I didn't really meet the co- too many coaches. They wouldn't be in the building, but I met some of the players. It was a good time. Saw the facilities. I was really looking forward to going up there in uh, Edmonton and really playing on the West Division for the first time. And it's just unfortunate we didn't we didn't get a chance to play this year. But we'll see how the future holds and where I'll, where I'll be heading next year. One hundred percent. And, and your, your goals for the next season, like what are they just to is always just to simply win a great cup or is it more like for you personally to get that, you know, the recognition that you, you're, you should have had by now. You should have, right. you do have a lot of recognition, but I think it should be even more because uh, I always hear your name when it comes to Hamilton, uh, Toronto, all, all of this. Mm-hmm. Right. So and seeing, seeing your, like, what is your personal goal going for the next season? My personal goal is always just to get better. I want to be productive and I want to just keep striving and keep getting better and better each and every year. And I feel like right now I've just entered my prime. I understand the game so much. Things have really opened up for me. And it's just like now is the time to capitalize and to show how I can really play. I feel like I'm one of the best linebackers, not just in the CFL, but in North America. So it's both leagues, you know. So, So I just want to continue to show that. I just want to continue to make plays and continue to do it at a, at a high rate. And that's what I've been doing for the last three years in the CFL. And I feel like my game has grown so much in that time. It's just, it's really tremendous though. Like thinking where I came from, just switching over from quarterback to now, it's leaps and bounds. I watched the old film and I'm like, I can't believe I was playing like that. Yeah, I, thought, I thought I was already thin, but like now I'm like, my old self couldn't play with myself now. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's crazy seeing the growth and it, it excites me and it makes me want to go even harder. So each year, my, my goal is just to get better. The Great Cup is always the goal. The Great Cup is always the, in the end goal. But personally, my goal is always to get better and better. Whether they give me the recognition or not, I know I know who I am. I know I know how I can play. And I know that these guys, they pump up, pump up and they don't speak my name that they don't want to see, see me beside them because it, it is what it is. But it's just... It's just funny to me, but I just go out there and I just make plays. Let, I let the people talk. They can talk all they want, but I'm just going to keep making plays. 100%. I was just about to say, when you when you actually, you know, I went through Twitter and kind of saw this. Like, I started a decade at Blaine Junior College in Brenham, Texas. I'm thankful mm-hmm. for that. I remember ending the decade, coming off the best season of your career, ending your prime right now, and you're That's so right. hungry. So, I know I'm really, really wishing you the best going forward. Um, you know, of course, take over. Can you give them all your socials right now? Your socials on take over. Take over, <clears throat> take over underscore Tuggle. That's on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and you want to find me on any anywhere you listen to music. Take one. It's take the number one. We got a lot of music out right now. I'm only putting new music out on Audio Mac. So every week, a new song on Audio Mac. You search me up on there. You can find me find it right there. And uh, yeah, that's all, that's all that's going right now. Oh yeah, Team Takeover. Team Take Team Takeover dot net. We got a lot of new clothes. We got some new stuff coming. We got some stuff to come with my boy Sean. So we we, we got we got a lot of stuff we've been cooking up. Definitely, definitely. I know I love everything on on the website. Everything I'm definitely oh, pick some of up for sure really soon. But there we go. I last oh I, so many things to ask you, but last thing too, seeing like just everything going on in this pandemic and it comes to, to race, racial discrimination, anti black racism, all that stuff. You put out a little statement on your your Instagram too, just about all these companies and how they have to back you know actually be about it and not just talk right. about. It. Uh, you, you're from Georgia, of course. You probably see, you know witness. Uh, you know different, different, you know, anti-black racism to yourself, or it's here too, it's in Canada, it's everywhere, right? right. Um, like, how, how have you reflected when it comes to, 
you know, any changes from different people? I, people reach out to you and be like, hey, man, like, this is how I felt from different races. Like, how, how, how have you seen it, uh, you know, from both sides? Canada, you know, USA. To me, I haven't had really, to me, I haven't had too many people just reach out to say that, but I don't, I'm not necessarily looking for someone, someone to reach out and say like, hey, I've been, I'm sorry about, I'm not, I'm not really interested in that. Like, that's cool if you feel that way to do that, but you don't have to do that with me. Cause I understand if I know you personally and I accept you, I know what type of person you are for the most part. Right. But growing up in Georgia, I've seen a lot of racism. I see it every day. I, I still see racism every day where I'm at now. I see it, I see it when I'm in Canada. So it's like, it's a constant thing that no one talks about. Like Kanye said that one time. Yeah. And it's like, it's crazy that it takes all of this for a little thing to get pushed forward. Like everyone just wants equality, but it's like, you have to fight and you have to grab and people have to almost sacrifice their life just to get a little bit of equality. Right. And it's unfortunate with the, the time that we live in because so much is being spewed around. We have our own president down here who's spewing a lot of that hate around and it's igniting people and it's starting these, like this, 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 this war almost going on. And it's, it's, it's really unfortunate because it's affecting a lot of people and people think it's a game. And I see people talking about like Black Lives Matter and they want to say, well, it's a hate group. Or you want to say, this is not a hate group. But it's like, you keep missing the picture. You're missing the picture that people just want to be, want things to be equal. It's not about, it's just, it's just equality. Yeah. It's true. like, you have to fight so hard and try to change someone's mind about it. That just shows you where we are and how much we have, how much further we have to go. Mm -hmm. So, like, seeing everything now, I think it's easy for people to get discouraged with everything with uh, Breonna Taylor, that, that, the decision that just came out with her yesterday, yeah. with the officers. Mm -hmm. So, but I just think people need to just come together and put their money where their mouth is and put their, put their uh, and it's just so much, so much that you can do. It's not, it's not just about money, it's more about actions. I don't want you, you got a million dollars to give, that's cool, but what, you, what are you going to do past that? But this is a great time for companies to do a press run. Mm -hmm. It looks good. Cause like I said, black people pay, black people spend a lot of money in this country, in this world. So it's like, sometimes I, I see people do things, I see companies do stuff and it seems like it's half hearted or it's, you're doing this for an image. So I, my, my statement was, if you're gonna do it, really stand on it and do it. Don't just do it because it's cool or it's popular right now. I want you five months down the line, which is now, mm -hmm. I wanna see what, what, you, what are you doing? How are you standing? When this election comes, how are you standing? How are you standing with just the major points? No matter how you vote, no matter what you do, uh, how are you standing though? What, what are you standing on and what are you trying to be about? Because a lot of things going on right now, it's a lot of underlining, it's a lot of underlining comments and underlining situations being set up, but no one wants to really say it, what it is, or they're trying to push it to, to another corner. But it's, it's, this has been going on for a long time. I think we're just at the peak of it right now because people are just so sick and tired. Yeah, sick and tired, my man. This has been the most exhausting year for many of us. Right. So you know, definitely, hopefully, the change. And of course, keep speaking and change on your Twitter everywhere. Sorry, sorry, you know, team takeover. Continue to spread the positive message there. And really appreciate you having you on, man. Hopefully, we can have you back on when we're in the studio soon. But yeah, man, I really, really appreciate it. I can follow him at takeover. Is takeover one on, on no, Instagram? Take, takeover underscore Tuggle on Instagram, oh. Twitter. You find me on this. Just search Justin Tuggle. Tuggle will pop up. Right there, we go. Appreciate it, man. I really appreciate you. And no, thank you, man. I appreciate talking to you. Absolutely. That's the first and ten podcast. Keep balling. Let's go. Let me just, uh...